I speak to you in the name of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The principle by which I interpret these scriptures um, is actually a simple one. Um, it's, scriptures are complicated. Christianity is complicated. My opinion is not the only opinion. There are other opinions. And you just put that to one side and say, but this is mine. This is my opinion. And um, in the midst of that conversation about the meaning of scripture, which is a complex and variegated conversation, there are different ways of approaching the text. And they can all exist at the same time. That's I'm going to start by saying, before I get particular, I'm saying this does not exclude other interpretations. But this is mine. I believe God gave us the scriptures to teach us about spiritual realities that are true for us in the present day. So when Luke goes on and on and on about the particular time and place that John the Baptist came, it's a historical moment, it's, at, it's in the time of Annas and Caiaphas and Lysanias and so forth, but that, 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 that specificity is important, but it's important for a symbolic reason. And so the question I always bring to the text is, what does this symbolize? What does this evoke? What does this tell me about the spiritual journey? And there's a very potent way of understanding these Advent texts as we look for the coming of the birth of Christ and we look at the texts that are, are, uh, uh, that are anticipatory of Christ's coming, particularly John the Baptist, who's the central figure of today's reflections. Um, these, these texts and that period of time when they were anticipating the birth of Christ and, and they were calling for a Messiah that was going to be a Messiah not like what they expected, all symbolizes some reality in the spiritual life today. So I, I understand that to be this period of darkness, and of course it ties in at the time of the year, is a period of darkness in people's lives. And it can be a big one, or it can be a little one that you keep coming back to it again and again and again. Multiple metaphors, all possible at the same time. But I'm talking about conversion. Your life is going the wrong way. Prodigal son, heading down a dark path, and you're spinning your heels, and you're making bad decisions, and your bad decisions are compounding, and your your life is getting worse, and you your life getting worse makes you make more bad decisions, and you have a vicious cycle until you're in a place of deep, deep darkness. And hopefully, there's a come to Jesus moment in that darkness, and that turn from darkness to light is what is symbolized by the movement from the waiting for the Christ child to come to the birth of the Christ child. The birth of the Christ child symbolizes the coming of light in the midst of the darkness, the turn of the spiritual life from uh, what's not working, from separation from God, into a journey towards God. So the Advent season symbolizes that time just before the turn things are the most dark. Now, if we're talking about conversion, many people have experienced this in a very dramatic way in a certain particular place and time in their life, in the reign of the Emperor Tiberius and so on. But there might be a reign of the Emperor Tiberius in your life where you say, on April 13th, 1994, my life was this way. And something, the word of the Lord came to me, and I turned it around, and that, on that day I converted. Now, for those of us who've been active Christians our whole life, I can't point to a day like that, but I can point to a number of days or occasions or struggles in my life where I keep cycling around to these struggles again and again and again, but the dynamic is still the same. It's still a place of darkness. It's still a place where things aren't working, a place of separation from God, and where what I need to do is let go of whatever it is that's getting in the way and make that turn back towards God. And so that, that advent darkness is that place of separation from God, and the, the coming of Messiah is the turn towards God. Now, with that metaphor firmly in place, we now turn to John the Baptist. So my question for my reflections this morning is, how does John the Baptist figure symbolically in that spiritual place? 
place of darkness, the place of struggle, the place of a vicious cycle where things aren't working, whether it's a component of your life or whether it's your whole life. What is a John the Baptist in that metaphor? And again, a number of possibilities rise up. It could be as simple as your own conscience. Your own conscience could be your John the Baptist. The crazy man standing with his weird clothes and his weird words, standing in the corner going, this isn't working, repent, turn it around. You're sinning, it's not working. And so John's baptism is a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. So it is the moral framework. And sometimes our conscience is our John the Baptist. In our moment of darkness, there is some part of our consciousness that says, this isn't working. But I don't want to change. I know. But whatever you're doing, it ain't working. So like, you're not going to have a lot of good options here. You're going to have to change. You're going to have to give up something. And you're not going to like it. But that's necessary for the turn that you need. And of course, we look at the history of the prophets. John the Baptist stands in the tradition of the prophets. Nobody likes the real prophets. We all like the false prophets. A false prophet saying, everything is fine, just keep doing what you're doing, it'll go great. The true prophet is the one that stands up and says the unpopular thing that nobody likes, but you know is true. So to recognize the voice of John the Baptist in your heart, it's that feeling of, I know it's true, but I don't like it. That's the John the Baptist voice in the moment of conversion. Now, that's a psychological interpretation. It could also be a social interpretation. You could have a person in your life who is your John the Baptist. And that's a very, very special person. That person has to be a very good friend who can say to you, I love you, I will support you no matter what you're doing, but what you're doing isn't working. And I can see that. And when you're ready to turn it around, I'm here for you. That's a John the Baptist for you in your life. And sometimes you may have those and you may be mad as hell at them, but you know they got your back and you know they have an interest at heart. So this metaphor of the John the Baptist, the crazy man that comes and says uncomfortable truths and talks about repentance and conversion is as true in the contemporary spiritual life as it was 2,000 years ago. My last point, and this is a very short sermon, because it's, it, I can't fill in the blanks. This is for you to fill in the blanks in your own lives. You may actually be the John the Baptist figure for someone else. That's the hard one. Um, I am cautious in encouraging that interpretation because, as with prophecy, there are a lot more people that are likely to be false prophets than true prophets. It's easier to be a false prophet, and the people that most want to be prophets are usually the false ones. But when you feel like you love a person and it's not working, you sometimes have to be that John the Baptist figure to say, I love you, I care about you, I want what's best for you. What I see doesn't seem to be working. And if I can help you in any way with that, I can't make your choices for you, but if I can help you, and therefore, and I have benefited from those kinds of friends in my life. Um, haven't always appreciated it, but I've always needed it. And in the hindsight, I'm always grateful for it. And when we are called to be in that position, then it's an uncomfortable place. We don't want to be that voice, and yet maybe we are called to be that voice. Final point. That's individually, socially. This metaphor works again. A society can be going into a place of deep darkness. We need the prophetic voices that, are, that tell us the uncomfortable truths. What we're doing isn't working. We need to turn this ship around. We need to repent. We need to convert. And when I think of the geopolitical struggles that we are in today, I can think of a number of John Baptist figures that I look to who tell me things that make me uncomfortable but which I know are true. <clears throat> things that tell me about how much I'm driving my fossil fuel car. People that tell me about how our money works in our society and where it goes and who makes the decisions about it and what that means. 
things that people that tell me about how the politicians are working and the decisions they are making in terms of international relationships that serve the interests of the various uh, war machinery and uh, financial institutions and so on, and not the interests of populations. These are ne never anything we want to hear, because they usually involve us in, uh, accepting a certain level of sacrifice, which we don't want to do. Um, I like red meat, too, by the way. <laughs> and I know better, and people have told me, and they're right, and I hate it. And yet, that's the John the Baptist. And it's part of this much bigger story of this place of darkness, this place, this downward spiral, or spiral which we need to turn around. We need to hear those John Baptist figures, or maybe even be those John Baptist figures, which are an essential part of preparing the way for conversion. It's not the conversion itself, it's just preparing the way. So wherever you connect to that, that for me is the reflection this morning about John Baptist. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen.